it's quite clear that black is paedophilic. Um, and there's no doubt at all about that. I think Robert Black um, is probably best summed up as he is the definition of every parent's nightmare. But also, Black is full-on psychopathic and has no capacity for empathy or remorse for his victims whatsoever. <laughs> You were watching Caroline. Then what did you do? Nothing. Did my job. And once the victim is secured, they become merely a vehicle for his expression of paedophiliac desires. It would seem that, that you know, from the moment Black woke up in the morning, Till the moment he went to bed at night, his thoughts were given over to, to the abuse of children. In the catalogue of crime, there is no more abhorrent in the eyes of the law and the public than the murder of a child. When you add a sexual motive, police will leave no stone unturned in the search for the killer. But one such paedophiliac murderer remained at large for many years. He carried out grotesque acts of indecency against his young victims and dumped their bodies in various locations across the UK. On a hot Friday afternoon in July 1982, an 11-year-old girl was walking back to her home in Northumberland. She'd been playing tennis in the town of Coldstream in the borders between Scotland and England. But young Susan Maxwell never made it home. She fell prey to Robert Black. Her sudden disappearance horrified Scotland. A little girl walking home from, from, a, from a tennis game on a summer's afternoon in a beautiful part of, of, the, of the Scottish borders where crime doesn't happen. You know, it wasn't some sort of inner city gang thing. It was, you know, it really brought home to people. It was the sort of destruction of innocence of, of, of really that part of Scotland. Your mother, Robert. Tell me about your mother. I never knew my mother. She abandoned me when I was a kid. Didn't even know my father's name. It's very far from the ideal start in life. And pretty well every uh, denominator of um, successful, stable personality development was not exactly um, uh, there for him. Black spent his early years in the Scottish Highlands. He was fostered by a couple called Jack and Margaret Tulip. What about Margaret? Your foster mother? Did she tell you anything? She died when I was 11. Then there was no one. I got sent to home. When Margaret died, they sent me away. I lost my confidence. Retreated into myself, lost my friends. Lost my home. Black lost his foster father when he was five, and his foster mother died six years later. Unhappy at school, he was often aggressive towards other children, who called him names and shunned him. Known as smelly Bobby Tulip in the local community, the young Robert Black had very few friends. He had a pretty rough start, but others too have a particularly rough start, and they don't go on to become serial um, killers and abductors of defenseless little girls.
people who begin to bring uh, their fantasy world into reality very often do it gradually and then it becomes a pattern of behaviour that they keep repeating and that they escalate in. As a child, Robert Black developed seriously abnormal sexual fantasies. Later in life, he recalled feeling that he would have preferred to be a girl and used to dress up in female clothing. Black was destined to spend the remainder of his childhood in and out of care and ended up in children's homes. In the early 1960s, it was decided that Black should be placed in the more disciplined and all-male environment of a boy's home. A string of offences followed, including the attempted rape of a girl. A pattern was set. The etiology of psychopathy is really very little known. Um, we do know that they share a lot of interesting characteristics. They're almost always from broken homes. They have almost always shown a conduct disorder in their teens, as it's called. After your stepmother, Mrs. Chillip, after she died, you were sent away to Musselburgh. To her home. That's when they interfered with me. Couldn't leave. Couldn't tell anyone. There's nowhere to go. I was recommended. What do you mean? When a boy left the home, a boy that was being interfered with, he had to find a replacement. I was recommended. You were abused. My reports improved. That was the deal. A lot of uh, importance has been put on the fact that he became one of a succession of boys um, where it was suggested that each boy, when they left the home, would recommend another boy and he became the one who was recommended to the abuser. And obviously that's entirely unacceptable, but it doesn't necessarily translate that that is a stepping stone for paedophilia. Black eventually secured a job as a delivery driver and accommodation in a hostel in a town near Glasgow. He later admitted to molesting a number of girls during this phase of his life. Did you ever have a girlfriend? <laughs> yeah, I had a girlfriend. We split up. When we split, I had to move away for work. How did that make you feel? I felt rejected. Abandoned. The way my mother left. Margaret left. They all left. I'll never pull. to call me names. Violating other children that survived, on his own admission, he's violated somewhere between 30 and 40 in a given patch. I strongly suspect that is a very, very conservative estimate. Given the kind of profile he has as an opportunist, psychopathic killer, uh, it would be surprising if he hadn't started exhibiting that behaviour early in, earlier in his life because, by and large, uh, serial killers and uh, serial killers in, in particular uh, are usually men in their 20s or 30s. Uh, but that's just a normative thing. I mean, it, it may be that we have an abnormal case here.
The attempted rape of the seven-year-old resulted in Black being admonished, but not charged. Eventually, he left Scotland and moved to London. He obtained low-paid work as a van driver for a poster delivery company. Black stayed in cheap accommodation and gave away little of himself. That would, if you like, be part of the modus operandi. Uh, it is not unusual for people like him, psychopathic serial killers, to be drifters. Pedophilia. Uh, the, in Greek, means the love of um, children. Um, but in modern day parlance has come to mean the inappropriate um, sexual love of children by an adult. Hello, love. Okay, then? I'll take it. Beg your pardon? I'll take the room. And it can be um, attraction to children of both genders, it can be attraction to children of one gender, same gender, other gender, and it can be attraction to prepubescent children right down to the level of babies, right up to the level of postpubescence um, prior to legal age of consent. They bring their vulnerabilities to that person, and that's exactly what this kind of person wants. They want someone who they can subjugate, and someone who will bend to their will, and someone who they can use. When 11-year-old Susan Maxwell went missing in 1982, it was in highly unlikely circumstances. Susan was a farmer's daughter from the small village of Cornhill and Tweed in the Scottish borders. Susan's a great optimist and I would like to think that I would be optimistic as well. Every morning I feel this is going to be the day. She's going to, we're going to get that phone call today to say she's going to be all right and Come and get them. A massive police hunt for Susan was carried out. Susan had been walking home in broad daylight and in a well populated area. Two weeks later, she still had not been found. Her parents had just returned from broadcasting a live appeal on national radio when police arrived with devastating news. A uh, child's body had been found, and about 99% certain <coughs> that it was Susie. I remember he, he's, he wouldn't use the word dead, no, though. No, he didn't, that was strange. He said, we've found a girl, and she's not alive. And that's when you feel this sort of coldness going through you. I mean, even though you've been bracing yourself for two weeks, this sort of coldness goes right through your whole body. It's a really strange feeling. The hit has to get bigger. It's, it is like an addiction in that sense. Uh, and that's one way you could read it, that he was needing to get bigger hits. Susan's killer lived in a sordid, solitary world of depravity. Black had few friends and divided his time between his work and his fixation with little girls. 
I think if you met him in the street, you'd, you'd think that he was perhaps you know, rather an unpleasant person. He, certainly, I don't think uh, bodily hygiene came very high in his, in his uh, list of priorities. We have someone who has got a very, very private world going on behind those eyes. Almost exactly a year after Susan's murder, a five-year-old girl went missing from a fun fair in Portobello on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Caroline Hogg was a popular and trusting little girl. Given her very young age, the alarm was raised immediately when she did not come home. He is an impulse killer. He finds himself in the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances, and he commits the crimes. 8th of July, 1983. Does that date mean anything to you? Not particularly. It's the day Caroline Hogg disappeared. Caroline's parents, like Susan's, were thrust into the public eye. The police were really very helpful to the media. They had to be because they had so little to go on. Black's sinister obsession with children's clothing had not diminished. And of course the way that fantasy works uh, in all this is that we all fantasize. That's what makes us human. That's what divides us in some ways from other animals, that we have such a facility to imagine. We all imagine what it's going to be like to try and form a relationship with another person, to uh, think sexually about that, to act it out in our fantasies, and eventually, hopefully, to act actualize that in reality. Now, while that's legitimate and normal, that's fine. The problem with a psychopath is that he does not have the conscience, the feelings, uh, the social checks that we all have. And it comes as absolutely no surprise whatsoever that he's not putting his hands up for any of it in terms of um, acknowledgement of guilt or innocence. Because in so doing, be it acknowledgement of guilt, statement of innocence, he'd have to defend himself. And that would bring out the possibility that he'd have to tell us about his private world. Well, it came yesterday to open it if somebody does see it at the home. We'll just bring her back, whoever has her. And if anybody knows anything at all, just to let the police know. But ten days after she went missing, Caroline's body was found. It's very easy for a grown man to push about a five-year-old, a ten-year-old, a fifteen-year-old girl. Um, and uh, as a consequence, they are perfect targets. The pattern very often uh, with people like him is not to conceal, but it was quite clearly part of his modus operandi. Caroline's body was not concealed. She was found in Leicestershire many miles from her Portobello home. Clearly, she had been driven south from Scotland. The five-year-old's tiny body had simply been dumped in a ditch by the man who had abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered her. In order to understand why he uh, made no attempt to dispose of the body or conceal the body more accurately, uh, you have to understand that they were by that stage nothing more than a vehicle. Black continued to live a seemingly mundane life, making ends meet as a driver and living in cheap bedsits in London. Later it was revealed that several acquaintances had stopped seeing him because his behaviour around their children left them very uncomfortable. But he was never reported to the police. Sleep well? Like a baby. Good. That's what I like to hear. 
sorry. Is she disturbing you? Fresh orange. Bridget, why don't you go and do that in your room, love? Tea or coffee? Tea, please. The investigation into the deaths of Susan and Caroline grew to such a scale that Northumbria CID were drafted in to coordinate the various police forces involved. It was the first time in the UK that a senior officer was put in charge of an inquiry crossing forces and national boundaries. There are similarities between the two deaths, uh, which tend to leave some people to think that the same person is responsible. But I must also say there are certain differences, and it's just possible in fact, more than possible, that two different people are responsible. Perhaps slightly unusually for police in those days, he, he, he established very, very uh, strong personal relationships with the relatives of the victims of these crimes, and he became very um, aware of their needs uh, in terms of information, uh, and, and he was always anxious to um, uh, ensure that uh, if there was going to be a development that these parents found out about it first he, he you know he was he was he was mortified at the thought of um, of them finding out something from any other source other than him a police photo fit of a man seen with caroline hogg at the fairground near edinburgh resembled robert black very much as he looked at the time of her disappearance but despite widespread circulation it failed to lead police anywhere near him there's a swimming pool in Portobello. You used to go there to watch the children. To watch one child in particular that day. You were watching Caroline. Then what did you do? Nothing. Did my job. People saw you there in your van free to travel around and watch children, pick up the children you wanted, pick them up in your van. No. You are seen. That's not me. Psychopaths always think that they're better than the rest of the world. And they always think that they have power and knowledge. Uh, and he's hanging on to that power and knowledge in that it's not confessing, not telling what happened. Black was an extremely daring predator of children, often stalking little girls in daylight and in public places. He carried his abduction kit in the van in case the opportunity ever arose. He, he had bindings and gags and a sleeping bag to, to put them in. He is an impulse killer. He hasn't planned carefully for these killings. They, they're, they happen. They're, they're due to the circumstances, and he's an opportunist. He structured his day. So as he, as he went around the country uh, delivering posters, uh, he, he, would, he would make sure that he, was, he would go to the areas where uh, he was likely to see children playing. <laughs> Police were becoming convinced that the killer was a man who drove for a living because of the scattered locations near motorways where the bodies had been found. Public concerns began to place greater pressure on the investigation, especially since some tabloids compared the abductions and killing of the young girls with the notorious Moore's murders. Another very important characteristic is the complete inability to empathise with other people. That is to take the place of the other person and understand what they're feeling, because they haven't got the feelings themselves to understand it. The other one that's very apparent when you take a history of a psychopath is that they are unable to learn from experience. And we've also got, critically, 
the um, capacity to know what he's doing is wrong, to know that it is abhorrent to society, and to know that he's willing to lie, lie, and lie again. Tragically, police were unable to prevent Black striking again in March 1986. This time in England, Sarah Jane Harper had gone to the local corner shop on a brief errand for her mother. It was early evening, but a dark, miserable night was drawing in. Sarah bought a loaf and two packets of crisps. She was seen by witnesses walking the route back to her home and then vanished. It was now becoming more and more apparent to senior police officers that they were more than likely looking for one man. The killer was using the same tactics over again, and his crimes were spreading geographically. Sarah Harper's body was eventually found in the River Trent to the west of Nottingham. Pathology reports concluded that she had been seriously sexually assaulted and that she was alive but unconscious when put in the water. Indications were that Sarah had been in the river for around three weeks. Police drafted in employees of British Waterways to try and help pinpoint the exact location where the killer might have dumped his third young victim. He's got to be stopped. He's got to be put away. He's got to be stopped. He can't go on abusing children as he has done. In your van. Free to travel around and watch children. Pick up the children you wanted. Pick them up in your van. No. Names of suspects and witnesses were cross-checked against the police database in Edinburgh looking after the earlier two killings. Sarah was a Salvation Army girl, the embodiment of innocence ripped apart by the man who had abducted, assaulted and murdered her. The identity of the individual becomes of virtually no significance whatsoever. And if they die, well, that's just a, uh, an accident that would happen. And he's, I believe, even used that word, an unfortunate accident. I think uh, there was a kind of a two-pronged approach to it, the public and the private. And I think publicly, the police are always terrified to create a monster. Black continued to do as he pleased. Despite his past convictions, he never once came under the police radar. proven willingness to lie and a proven willingness to show um, no remorse whatsoever and no concern for the victim during uh, the attack or the consequences for the victim, um, then that is an extremely dangerous thing and mercifully that combination is rare. Quite remarkable case that was that was based not on not on sort of great detective work per se, but but on absolutely slogging away through thousands and thousands and thousands of company records. The the company that, that Black worked for had kept very detailed accounts of all the deliveries that all their drivers had made, all the petrol sales that their that the drivers uh, had had made, um, and and they were able to um, put Black in areas of the uh, abductions and the, the dumping of the bodies uh, by, by meticulously piecing together all these things. Computers remained basic, and a killer's strength was that he was always on the move. Then, a technological breakthrough had a major impact on the case. The Home Office Large Major Inquiry System, HOMES as it came to be known. Holmes was introduced into the British Police Service after the debacle of, of the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry and the fact that Sutcliffe had, had appeared in, in, the, in the inquiry in, in uh, Yorkshire on more than one occasion 
and there'd been nothing in place to, to identify that fact and heighten the suspicion with which the police should have regarded him. Peter Sutcliffe had been interviewed nine times before he was finally convicted in 1981 of the murder of 13 women. With only paper and no system of cross-reference, he was freed without charge each time. Holmes was developed as a result. Like Sutcliffe, Black was not in fact on any system. And, and they don't like to say at too early in a stage that there's one person in all likelihood responsible for all three abductions. But I think privately, because the, the cases were so strikingly similar, they probably knew um, from the moment that uh, Caroline Hogg uh, was abducted from, from Portobello that in all likelihood uh, they, they will be looking for just one person. Black was by now living in Stamford Hill, North London. When his home was searched following his eventual arrest, police were to discover a mass of hardcore pornographic film and photography depicting children that appalled them. Way before the internet became a part of everyday life, Robert Black was going to whatever lengths he needed to, to acquire the worst kind of child pornography imaginable. I mean, it would be as important to him, I reckon, as eating and drinking. Can you tell me what happened in Grangemouth? I stayed in a boarding house. You were accused of molesting your landlord's nine-year-old granddaughter. It wasn't like that. She got something from it, too. There were items of clothing, children's clothing, found inside your van. It made me feel close to them. I like the swimsuit touch the cloth, wear it next to me. And the photographs of children? I just take pictures of them. Watch them, playing, swimming, with their families. Robert, if you had a child, if you were a child's father, and you saw someone taking photographs of your little girl. What would you do? Go to the police. Get help. Get it all sorted out. Officers began to hope that the child killer would make a mistake, and in the summer of 1990, he did just that. The arrest of, of Black was just um, a, a fantastically good example of, of good citizenship. It happened in the peaceful village of Stowe in the borders of Scotland and England. Local man David Herkes was mowing his lawn one afternoon when he noticed something. As he was walking up and down his garden, he, he, he saw a van stop, thought nothing of it, saw uh, a girl that he, that he vaguely recognised walking on the pavement. As uh, the girl disappeared behind the van, uh, Mr. Herkes became aware that she hadn't emerged from the other side. I took the registration, I nipped over to a neighbour's house and said, you know, for the family at home, one was playing a two-door up with a friend, and I told her what I thought I'd seen. Of course, panic. Ran into his house and phoned the police. And Black had, had driven out of the village at high speed in the van. Uh, and he realised he was going the wrong way, so he, he turned around in a lay-by and came back down the A7 through the village, obviously rather hoping that uh, no one would have been aware of what he'd just done only minutes beforehand. And of course, quite the reverse was true. The, the street was uh, alive with people by this stage. Uh, his van came through, the policeman um, stopped the van, uh, and very quickly found the little girl in the back of the van, bound, gagged, uh, stuffed into a sleeping bag. So she'd been covered with a cushion cover, plastic plastic tied and zipped in a sleeping bag. And this van, and it was a really warm, a really hot summer's day. 
The child's father was one of the first on the scene. It was a horrendous feeling to discover that she was like that. I think I stopped momentarily from actually releasing her just to gather my breath. Uh, and once I got her released, removed from the, the van, carried her home, there was just a sense of sheer relief after that. Probably um, maybe only an hour from death. It was just luck. Just in the right place at the right time. If I hadn't stopped to adjust a lawnmower, I'd have missed the whole incident. It'd been over and done with before I realised. The first one I've known was when the, the child was reported missing it, well, much later in the day. The investigations into the disappearances of Susan, Caroline and Sarah Jane had still drawn a blank, but their murderer was finally caught by a sheer stroke of fate. I always try to be honest, and I've got to say that my biggest hope lay in him doing something which brought him to the notice of the police. Black was tried in Scotland for the attempted abduction of the little girl in Stowe. He pled guilty, and finally detailed reports were instigated into his background. The presiding judge, Lord Ross, ruled that Black was such an immediate danger to children, he should be sentenced to life. Black had been practicing indecent behavior towards young children since his early teens. The net was about to begin closing as police set about questioning him for the three unsolved murders. I think it was obvious to everyone that, that he was the man that they'd been looking for for all these years for the, for the uh, Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg and Sarah Harper cases. Robert Black was identified as a suspect in the three lined inquiries but there was no single piece of hard evidence to tie him to the murders dating back to 1982. But it would in the end be the tiniest item that would lead to Black's convictions, not a photograph of a child. It was this evidence that police chose to focus on as they were finally permitted to interview him about the missing girls. It was August 1990. Police had built up a case that was beginning to place Black in the locations where the girls had disappeared. I want you to look at this. Do you know what it is? A petrol receipt. It's from a garage in Belford. You know the one? It's about 25 miles from the Scottish border. Can you read the date? Yes. 8th of July, 1983. Does that date mean anything to you? Not particularly. It's the day Caroline Hogg disappeared. Can you verify for me that that's your signature at the bottom? I drive all over the country. It's my job, making deliveries. You made a delivery that day. Do you remember? It's over four years ago. To a depot in Edinburgh. Piers Hill, to be exact. On the streets away from where Caroline Hogg lived. There's a swimming pool in Portobello. You used to go there to watch the children. To watch one child in particular that day. You were watching Caroline. Then what did you do? Nothing. Did my job. People saw you there. In your van. Free to travel around and watch children. Pick up the children you wanted. Pick them up in your van. No. You were seen. It's not me. Take another look. It looks nothing like me. Do you recognise this child? No. What about this child? You've got the wrong man. He's crossed several very serious boundaries. And then to have no capacity to acknowledge 
anything in terms of his involvement with any of it. Ten charges were eventually brought against Black, taking into account his various offences over many years. A deeply complicated and multi-layered case gradually built up, until eventually Black was brought to trial at Newcastle Crown Court under the laws of England and Wales. He pled not guilty to every charge. His conduct through the trial was, was really quite emotionless. Uh, he, he just sat and, you know, he, he was just almost like a member of the public, just sitting watching the trial unfold around him. What do you expect a child killer to look like or, or behave like? When the guilty verdict came in, he is reported to have looked across the police officers and said, well done, boys, before he was led down. Now then, if that's true, that is pure form psychopathy. Pure form, because he'd sat there totally capable of sitting there listening to being defended in this way, in the full knowledge that he would then look over at the police officers, some 20 plus of them, and go, well done boys. That is pure form psychopathic behavior. Black was sentenced to life with the judge's recommendation that he serve a minimum of 35 years. It was a lifetime spent abusing young girls. Twelve years had passed since the date of Black's first charge, and over 190,000 interviews had been recorded. The investigation paperwork weighed 20 tons. Why someone uh, commits a crime like that is largely irrelevant, and it's certainly irrelevant to the families of the victims who, who really, um, I would imagine, don't care very much about what happened to Black in the past. We know that this person is now um, safely in jail for, for and protect, the public are going to be protected, but uh, it's not going to make any difference to us, really. It may draw some sort of veil over an episode that's gone on a, a long time, but um, as far as we're concerned, all that matters is we don't have Susie. The, the loss is the major thing. I really don't care what happens to him. Rehabilitation doesn't come into it. He's not going to be released. We don't care much how rehabilitated or otherwise he is. Absolutely zero you can do to change that level, that depth of um, paedophilia and psychopathy. It's, it's just not an option. All one can do is to prevent him acting out on it. And you can have my view for nothing that uh, the only way you can do that is to keep him in uh, carcerated. I would find it very hard to to think that a man as, as fundamentally evil as, as Robert Black would be able to turn off these urges for long periods of time. And I, I would imagine that um, he will have been responsible for far more than perhaps we'll ever know. If we're going to find the word fortunate about anything to do with Black, then he is rare. Bridget? Why don't you go and do that in your room, love? 